thank you, Lina. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here today to talk to you all. Um, so as Lina said, I'm Sarah. I work for SMART, which is a cooperative of freelancers. We're active in uh, eight European countries. We started out in Belgium. And uh, what we do is we provide all the services that freelancers need uh, in a mutualized way. And we consider ourselves as a shared enterprise for freelancers, but I'll come back to that later. <clears throat> because the first thing that, um, I, and just for a little framing up, what I do um, and why I've been asked to talk about the issues of freelancers and what we can do to create a, a sustainable ecosystem is um, I do uh, research. Uh, I, I collaborate in research to develop more knowledge about freelancers because it's really a topic that needs to be deepened. We only have little issue, uh, little data actually. Um, also, I do advocacy at European level and I collaborate uh, in projects with different networks uh, regarding freelancing, social protection and the cooperative movement broadly. So it gives you a little idea where I stand. Um, so I've been working on the issue of freelancers in Europe for a few years now and I've been asked today to talk a bit about the main challenges that we see and what are the solutions that can be developed. So. Um, just to start, I'm really happy to talk about this topic because I think that freelancers are really an enormous added value to the economy of the 21st century. Um, they are known to be linked to uh, innovation. They are locally rooted, even though their activities can have an international uh, dimension and outreach. And uh, I also believe that they're actually the best allies for the transition uh, that we're facing today, or at least the transition we need to make, <laughs> given the social and environmental challenges that uh, our world is actually facing today. Because uh, freelancers are very resilient and flexible workers, and they're, as I said, at the top of in, uh, innovation. And they're also, what we see in different research, uh, at the forefront of the transformation of what the world of work, in the sense that a lot of more and more people um, and especially within the freelancers are really looking through freelancing to have a, another way of working without subordination and total autonomy but it's also about sense making it's about having a job that makes sense to you um, and so I think this, this is very important it's a type of work um, that should be promoted for these added values but then all these uh, uh, the freelancing and the way it happens does come with some complications as well so I also want to stress that so when I talk about, usually when we talk about freelancing, we talk about self-employed people. But when I talk about freelancers, I don't necessarily talk about only the self-employed. What I consider uh, as and smart in general and people with whom we work uh, consider as freelancers are people who have a know-how, they have skills and competences, and they want to make a living out of it by selling uh, products or services they develop uh, for diff and they have different clients and uh, they don't have any fixed uh, employees. <clears throat> they may be working in collaboration with others, but they don't have fixed employees. So this is what we talk, um, talk when we talk about freelancers. Um, they are very autonomous in the way they work, uh, but they can also work on very different legal statuses. So the most known, as we said, are the self-employed, but we also have um, people who are um, on account with, uh, that are working that are or that are salaried workers that work directly for an employer for a, a short time. I mean, at least a fixed term contract, which can be very short or it can even last two years if you think, for example, of IT consultancy sometimes. And they'll be hopping from one employer to another. And this is why they're considered as um, freelancers in, in our view. But you also have people um, who, thanks to cooperatives like SMART, but also like other models like you can find in France, which are called Cooperative d'Activité d'Emploi. So I would translate employment and activity cooperatives that allow freelancers who have different clients um, to actually be salaried workers so that they access the best social protection. We'll come back on this question of social protection later on. So the issue with freelancers is that they, given the multiplicity of, of the, even in the legal status under which they work, it's very actually difficult to find them statistically and to really identify how many freelancers are there. Um, the other difficulty is that the uh, freelancers work in very different sectors of activities. You have people in arts and culture, in IT, well-being, tourism, catering, and you name it. <laughs> They're basically in every sector of activity. And um, there's also often in the, the debates about social protection, a big question that arises often is freelancing done by choice or not? 
even here, the situations can be very different from, uh, from one freelancer to another. You have people who have a real entrepreneurial perspective and who really want to grow. You have people, so it's a real choice. You have other people who, who have to be freelancers because that's just the way it works in their sectors of activity. I'm thinking, for example, in the arts and culture sector, it's very difficult to find a, a fixed job. Um, usually people have to be freelancers if they want to work in those sectors. Um, sometimes it freelancing just happened out of opportunity uh, and other times, uh, unfortunately, and that's one out of five self-employed, apparently, following the Eurofund uh, um, report on self-employment, one in five is, it was the only way for them to work, actually. Um, they could not find any, any job and that was not, being their own boss wasn't necessarily their choice. So we have to t bear in mind that there's all this variety of, of, of um, paths and reasons that led people to be freelancers. And then last but not least, there's also a lot of very different levels of income. The levels of income can be very different uh, clearly from one sector to another. You take the arts sector compared to the IT sector, for example, but it can also be the very different within a same sector. Uh, once again, if you take the arts se sector, artistic sector, you have like that 1% that makes billions and you have like 99% of the people who are not as rich. <laughs> Um, so what are the trends? Why is it so important to talk about the freelancers? Uh, it's important to know that it's the fastest growing category of the labor market. Um, and I'm saying freelancers, I'm not saying the self-employed. Self-employment is stable, but freelancers within the self-employment just boomed in the last, uh, since 2008, actually. And it's also very important to tackle because we're always talking about the winners, but they're also the people who are most at risk of poverty. Uh, it's mostly because of discontinuity of income and the lack of adapted social protection. And um, so it means that basically any big economic downturn, uh, like the loss of a big client, uh, confinement measures <laughs> or even an economic crisis can really um, trigger the, 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 the economic situation of uh, freelancers. And even personal life incidents can have a major impact on the, on the income, uh, major illnesses, sometimes even maternity, um, but even a divorce can really shift the situation of a freelancer whose balance can also sometimes depend on uh, an overall income of the household. Um, so what are the biggest challenges that we see? Well, what we've seen uh, in different European countries along the years is that whatever the social legal status under which the freelancers are working, the, they, it's very easy to start once you have the, the skills and competences, uh, competences sorry, uh, and uh, actually the, the, the cost of the, the production tools are usually very low. Often you just need a laptop, uh, maybe a few other tools, but they're, they're really, e it's easy to start. What's more difficult is to make it a sustainable business. It's not always easy to outreach to potential clients. You have a lot of work and prospection and communication. You also have a, a question of taxation, which can be quite tricky. And from one country to another, it can be more or less tricky or easy. Um, but sometimes you have aspects such as, uh, uh, I don't know, your VAT is counted on, on your, your benefits from uh, two years before. And you have to keep that in mind when you're doing your taxes and putting um, and organizing your business. So making a business sustainable is the one. The administrative workload is uh, quite uh, important. Um, in many, uh, you have a lot of like, different legislations you have to deal with. Um, the declaration of income, the social contribution, the taxation. Sometimes you haven't even have to be aware about safety and security uh, measures uh, and so on. Um, and you all have to deal with that all by yourself. Um, and in some countries, it can be even more complex because as we know, a lot of freelancers are actually slashers. It means that they don't only have one job, they have different jobs. They can be journalists and editors and uh, trainers at the same time. And following the countries, you may be dealing with different uh, legislation and even le binding legal statuses following the job you're doing. I'll just give you an example. In France, if you're a comedian and you're performing live, you're mandatorily a salaried worker. 
But if you are an author, you're mandatorily self-employed. And that means that this slasher, this freelancer is going to have to be dealing with totally different um, social security regimes and opens, uh, opening to rights. The third thing is um, is being paid at a reasonable reasonable time. Uh, the delay in payment uh, can be very difficult on the cash flow of the worker. So you may have um, an activity that is rolling, but the fact that the clients are not going to be paying on time is going to make it very complicated. It's more true in some countries than others. Uh, for example, in Italy, this is a major issue. Uh, like it takes months, sometimes even a year before they're paid. Um, and the level of income also, I think it's important to stress, uh, of the freelancers has really changed over the years. Uh, there's been a stagnation, if not a, a dropping of the level of income of, of freelancers in the last uh, at least 10 years, even more, 12, I would say. The fourth aspect that I think is important to take into account as challenging is the access to training. Um, when you're a freelancer, and, and there's a lot of freelancers that are in this, what we could call the knowledge economy, it's very important to, have, uh, to be up to date um, on your sector of activity. And so these very specific niche specialized training can be very expensive. And there are some schemes when you're a, a salaried re regular em uh, employed worker where the employer can take on part of the cost. But when you're self-employed, it's all on you. And so it can be, it can be challenging to keep your skills up to date. And then the, the last aspect that I would like to uh, challenge that we have identified at least uh, for the freelancing is the access to social security. So um, if you're self-employed, of course, you get less access uh, to social security than, uh, than if you're a salaried worker. It can be very different from one country to another. But usually, for example, you don't have access to unemployment, except in Nordic countries. And, uh, or sick leave can be very difficult to access. Uh, pension usually is a lower level. And even if you have access to some rights, also like maternity, usually they're going to be a lot lower than what you would access if you were a salaried worker. Um, and if you're self-employed, you often have to uh, comply with insurances and you have to buy them. And sometimes they're even mandatory. In Germany, for example, there was this big discussion about the health insurance, which is mandatory for self-employed, uh, but it's very expensive um, uh, because it's, a, it's, a, it's counted on a certain level of income that many freelancers cannot uh, actually pay for. And... Um, <clears throat> But even if you're a salaried worker working on uh, fixed term contracts, it can be difficult in many countries to access the same level of social protection than salaried workers, like those with the open-ended uh, full-time contract, uh, especially when it comes to, for example, uh, uh, spe special leaves and so on. Um, it can be sometimes difficult to access, uh, or paternity leaves, for example. It can be difficult to access the same level is what in the labor market policies you call standard employment, which is these open-ended uh, full-time contracts. So basically, um, all these things, the issues that I've been talking to you, in a, in a big company, it's the company who does that and who deals with that with specialized employees or sometimes even specialized department. But freelancers, they have to do it on their own. Um, so this is, I think, in a nutshell, the biggest challenges of freelancers uh, today. So I was asked not only to talk about the challenges, but also to see what can, um, what can the ecosystem of freelancers do to, cha to, 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 take on, to tackle these challenges. And what we believe is that actually, it's not because you're a freelancer that you have to do it all on your own. And, the best way to, uh, to go forward and to be stronger and to be able to, to um, tackle these challenges is to mutualize actually your resources. You're gonna, be, you're gonna have a better power of negotiation, for example, with insurances, if you're a group of self-employed, rather than if you're each of you going on your own. This is what we've been seeing in SMART. Um, and so the idea, I think, is really to develop together all the services that are needed and that are adapted to the way that the freelancers are functioning. I'm almost finished, Alina. <laughs> um, so, uh, and this is what we've done typically within SMART. What we've done in our cooperative is that we've thought of, first of all, what is the most protective legal status for, for freelancers, for workers, whatever. And we realized that it was 
salaried workers. So we mutualize the role of employer within our cooperative so that the freelancers can actually access to the salaried status. And then what else do we provide? We provide all the mutualized serve mutually uh, all the services that we've identified as important for the, the freelancers. So we provide training, we have advice. Um, half of the employees of SMART are um, people who give advice on a daily basis to, to freelancers on budgeting, uh, developing their, their, their activity, uh, and so on. We also have a guarantee fund, which allows us to pay the, the freelancers within the seven working days um, after the end of the contract. And, uh, and we have a debt collection. So even if the client doesn't pay or is late in paying, we, can, we take care of that, which also facilitates the relationship between the, the member of SMART and um, the client. Um, so we've all these aspects that I've been talking about, the training also we have, there's co-working, the, where do you work? What tools do you use? I think these are all aspects that can be mutualized. And this is what we're doing also um, within SMART because we thought that what we found in our 20 years of existence in Belgium is that that was the best way to support freelancers. And, but I think that a lot of, so if there's a lot of things that we can do uh, by like the freelancers by uh, collectivizing and mutualizing uh, together. Um, but there's a lot of things that are also depending on the legislation. And this is why for us, it was very important to, um, to participate in the European Freelancers Week. And I'm very happy that Janine pulled back the manifesto that was created, that was uh, set, set by the initiators, the founders of the Freelancers Week, so that we could put it back on the table, because a lot of issues are also depending on policies that are not grasping these new generation of, of, of self-employed workers, uh, these new freelancers that are coming, emerging from the service economy and the fourth industrial uh, revolution. So I think, I think there's a lot of things that have to happen also on a political level. And as I said, given um, the added value of, of freelancers on the market, their role uh, as uh, uh, in, uh, enabling innovation and, and, and their capacity to, to, to answer the challenges that we're, our society globally is going through, it's crucial that the policymakers and our public authority hear uh, the needs and find solution for freelancers. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, very important words at the end that we need to gain more support. And with that, I want to turn to Janine to tell us about European Freelance Week and Manifesto. Right, well, the European Freelancers Week was started uh, five years ago in 2015. The driver of the European Freelancers Week has always was, uh, was um, Matja Reis in from Croatia. He was the head of the Croatian Freelancers uh, organization and also was part of the original um, founding of the European Coworking Assembly, which I, uh, which I am an, an officer of now. And uh, Mattia came uh, together with uh, Francesca Pesca and with um, uh, Joel Delroy and they, came, they each of them uh, represented a freelancers organization in a European country. And they met up at a sort of meetup of, of that kind. And they said, what they noticed is, is every, right across Europe, every country handles it differently, but the problems of the freelancers were very much the same. And um, at that time, um, probably many of you remember freelancer, the nature of freelancing is was moving very fast started moving very fast in the early 2000s and yet in 2015 the prevailing position of quite a lot of people actually was that uh, freelancer is another word for unemployed who's heard that i mean that was a, an extremely common uh, position and that there are still large segments of the population that look at it that way and so what they decided was that wouldn't it be great if there were an event that could just shine a spotlight on freelancers, very much as though if you're sitting in a room with 400 people and I say, who's got a dog, stand up. And all those people stand up at once, then suddenly you see this massive effect. And so uh, fundamentally, that was the idea of the Freelancers Week. 
and the Freelancers Week started with a manifesto as well. They put together a manifesto um, that was published and uh, put out on the internet for everybody to sign. And that uh, is one of the reasons that we came back this year, pulled out the manifesto, had a look at it, because in five years, quite a lot of things have changed. And yet, the fundamental problems are the same. Our, our manifesto, when you look at it, is um, in a rubric. It's about sort of the basic things that we require from government and also from uh, other players in the economy, medium to large businesses. These are the things that are required for um, freelancers to take their correct role in the future of work. And um, those things are very much the same. We only changed one of them. We added one and it was co-working because in 2015 co-working was not as prevalent as it is now right across Europe. There were quite a lot of people who had still never heard of it. And uh, that is, I think now pretty much not the case. I think we're pretty mainstream now. Um, in running the European Co-working Assembly, one of the things that I feel extremely strongly about, and it's one of the reasons we do the European Freelancers Week, is um, as for community co-working, which is who we represent. Uh, corporate co-working has its own representation, doesn't need us. Um, for community co-working, local co-working, um, the... It is my opinion that community and local co-working is the infrastructure of the new economy if we will step up and take that role. And a very important part of that is, of course, the freelancers. It's not all of it. We also have micro businesses and small businesses and a number of other uh, collective kinds of uh, members. But in specific, the freelancers tend to be the pathfinders, tend to be the ones who find out the way to go and the rest of us follow. And so in my vision, uh, the, the community co-working ultimately serves the future of work by serving the freelancers. Uh, freelancers are not, not generally recognized. There is, is generally no representation of freelancers uh, when policy is made, when decisions are made. We don't really have a, a seat at the table. Um, I happen to think that Sarah might have something to say about that. <laughs> well, recognition. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it's true that it's, uh, as we said, that it's a very, I would say a very 21st century worker. Um, as I said, usually they're considered as self-employed workers. Uh, but when you think of self-employed workers, you often think of classic liberal professions uh, like uh, architects or lawyers. And um, But here we're talking a totally different thing. We're talking about people for whom it's easier to start a business, but um, they're not necessarily going to create all the assets uh, that was possible in, in these other jobs that are also very well organized. Um, and for example, um, so, so it's about how do we identify the freelancers within all the economic actors and um, and how do we dis, you know distinguish ourselves like for me the recognition is also very linked to the definition which is a hard one the definition um, and I, I was really happy when the in the debates uh, I was already there five years ago when and discussing the, the the manifesto with the with the founders and it, it is a unique subset of micro enterprises, uh, and uh, but they have with specific ways of working because, as we said, freelancers don't have fixed employees, so it's a different way of working, and they they also need uh, they're more in need of social protection. As a lot of studies have shown, uh, developed by the European Union institutions, also uh, than other workers. Uh, but today uh, our Social security systems don't allow that. Our social security system basically say, either you're autonomous and you do it all on your own, because they're still thinking of the liberal professions and the socioeconomic situation of the doctors of the 50s. <laughs> you had to be wealthy to start to be a doctor or a lawyer in the 50s when, you know, it's most of our social security was built after the Second World War, right after it started a bit before, but it was really consolidated at that time. And we still have these views of who the workers are and how they function and how uh, autonomous or needy they are uh, compared to that situation. And we have to really acknowledge the difference specific way of working of the freelancers as a specific subset of uh, SMEs. So it's about this recognition, which is really difficult to put forward. Yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, basically then you also have the, the regulation that also has to go with it. How can you allow freelancers to compete with uh, other organizations on the market? Um, it's sometimes like in public um, funding, uh, sorry, uh, I'm missing the word now, uh, public procurements. You need to show that you can pay at least two years and you, 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 have, you, can, you have the cash flow if there's any problem of amounts that are very, very important, even for a small enterprise. <laughs> um, so we really have to adapt a, a lot of different things. And the recognition comes first. And as I said, it is, a, it is a complex topic because of the diversity of the freelancers. But as you also stressed, Janine, even though um, they are very different situation in different countries, the same problems arise everywhere. So there is a macro level that we can find together. Can I interrupt you and ask yeah. a question? Is anybody lobbying for um, legislative change in the EU, trying to press some of these problems? I mean, many people are, many people are, and that's one of the reasons for the EF Week, one of the reasons for the efforts of SMART, one of the reasons for the freelancers' organizations per country is that- And, and how's that going? As, as one is lobbying, one of the uh, problems is that the lobbying efforts tend to be splintered. They tend to be, um, it is again a question, uh, the question of definition is not just one for governments and other enterprises, it's also one for us. Um, because, for example, the professional, uh, what Sarah makes reference to, doctors, lawyers, architects, people who are licensed, um, very often they have organizational groups that are doing lobbying. Very often they are considering uh, freelancer issues when they're doing it. But when they're doing it, they're doing it for their subset of people. And so the effect for other free in terms, we have a basic structural issue, which is we don't look at our ecosystem. I say this periodically when I'm talking about freelancers and people are always shocked when I say this. I don't think any of you will be shocked, but if anybody's shocked, put up your hand. And it is, um, it's not just social protection that freelancers lack, they lack civil rights. Freely discriminated against, if you are a freelancer, on the basis of all the forbidden categories. There is no problem, it's not illegal. You may freely sexually harass your freelancers. There are no laws against it. Why is that? Because we have proceeded from this model of employment, both in terms of work and in terms of literally our basic civil rights, which is quite astonishing. Um, and so as uh, the world is moving to a new way of working, which is, as you say, far more integrated and far more sustainable, um, there are institutions in the system whose purpose is to keep the system stable. There are creative forces, destructive forces, and stabilizing forces, and, and those are great. But um, the stabilizing forces, in my personal opinion, have had the ruling hand rather long, and um, it's, it's, it's time for the other two to come in, in terms of the new world of work. Can I react to, because um, I thought it was a very interesting question, and there's different things. Um, in fact, uh, for example, one of the main challenges that have been identified for quite some time now regarding freelancers is that they are not allowed to fit uh, minimum levels of income because they're considered as enterprises. And when enterprises do that, it's a cartel. So that question of how can freelancers fix minimum income under which they cannot go. So there's not this competition towards the bottom regarding levels of income. Um, there was this problem at the level of the European Union. The good news is that there's been a lobby for a lot of, from a lot of people and they've realized that it makes no sense. I mean, the, the, the dissymmetry of, of, of level of, of uh, negotiation and so on, make, you can't make freelancers believe that they're a cartel just because they're trying to fix a minimum price on, on, on the service. So actually, there is this, um, the, there is a whole work going on now by the commission to change that regulation, um, these competition regulations, so that freelancers can actually, do, and self-employed workers can actually do that. But this is like really recent.
it's been like in the last month that the, the commission has been starting interviews uh, on this topic. So this is a way forward. I think there's, 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 there's this European Pillar of Social Rights initiative that, started, that was signed by all the member states in 2017, which is a huge improvement uh, on, uh, on, on accessing rights for all workers, uh, not only self-employed, but all the workers should access uh, the same, that's the main idea, let's say. But European Union sees it, they only put recommendations before it really implements, it's going to take a lot of time. I see the European Union a, a lot more open to these questions than, than uh, and practical about these questions than actually the national authorities, because the national authorities are also a lot more binded by, as you were talking, like the, the people who already have the power here and who are already talking about labor uh, relations. Um, and I think that also that what's really interesting with um, with freelancers is that they really, uh, it's not about labor law rights, it's about rights of the citizens, right to be recognized and to work in dignity. And, and you also, if I would even take it a notch even larger, if you look at the, the labor market, there was this study in France, I don't know for every country, but in France and in Belgium, it works. There was a study by Alternative Economique, and they said, okay, if we calculate all the people who are working, all the working hours of the people who are between age 25 and 65, okay, because, you know, before 25, you may be in college or whatever, but 25, 65, you're supposed to be on the market working. They took all the working hours of all the people out there, and they they did equivalent, equivalent full-time. What came out is that one in three person is not working. It means that there's not enough work out there for everybody. And we're pretending everybody's responsible for making their money and they should be finding it on the market because the market's gonna do it. So I think we have to review all our solidarity based on the light of the productivity, how the automation changed things and how can we make rights that are, yes, also linked to labor, but also, first of all, linked to us as individual citizens that can need to access and live in dignity. And we have means, we just have to go get the money where it is. No. Um, the, notion of co the notion that we have set forward in the manifesto is that just as employees require, it's, it's what touches a little bit on what Sarah was just talking about. Um, every freelancer I know when they started had to reinvent the wheel. And every day, this is not at all difficult. You go on any interactive social media of your, to choose your poison and you will find um, dozens of freelancers saying, how do I get terms of use? How do I write up my contracts? How do I get people to pay me? What bookkeeping program are you guys looking at? How do you handle training? Where do you get business? These are the basic, basic questions and every single freelancer um, has to answer them for themselves and every single freelancer has to reinvent the wheel. And those initial questions for employees are handled by the employer. That's all part of the infrastructure. And one of the things that co-working spaces can provide, and a lot of them do provide, is that kind of infrastructure. There are a lot of collectives which are coming together to provide that infrastructure because it is the, the simple wasted energy of people in solving problems that have already been solved is um, not not serving the freelance community, let's say it like that. Um, and so what, what, we have, what we have done in the manifesto is essentially put out a call to local governments and to other stakeholders, like medium to large businesses, um, to uh, partner with their local co-working space, because I think that the, the co-working spaces um, that we refer to as, as corporate spaces tend to draw off the structure of the, um, they tend to have people who are already uh, supported in that structure. And that structure in terms of the local community ecosystem can and probably should be um, served by local co-working spaces. Um, I also want to, to touch base on the definition of freelancing because that's, uh, for me personally, that resonates a lot in the manifesto for the reason is that for, I'm, you know, freelance for, I think, five years or so, even more. Um, and for a long time, for me, it was um, 
kind of a, a block to call myself a freelance because even me <laughs> who started the business community to think that I'm freelance was something like, mm, it's not really serious. It's kind of secondary. It took me a while to overcome that uh, perspective and actually put freelancing in a, in a different perspective that it's uh, being independent. It's being responsible for what you do, creating your own work. Um, and just to celebrate that and also, you know, um, to raise awareness of freelancing, we have uh, launched I'm Freelance campaign uh, in conjunction with the Freelance Business Month, but also just uh, that it, you know, pops up more regularly on social media, on all the uh, social channels that uh, we talk about freelancing. And I think with, the more we mention it, the more we uh, spread the word about it, um, it's supposed to help us somehow, I believe. Um, uh, well, I assume the manifesto, once it's signed, will be directed to the right people, right, to take action, so at least to consider that. Uh, and whatever communities can do to help that movement uh, is, um, all, uh, we're always ready to, to support. Mm -hmm.